Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephanie Simpson, and I'm the Associate Vice Principal, Human Rights, Equity and Inclusion. And it is my pleasure to be your host today for this special online town hall for faculty and staff regarding university planning in response to the current COVID-19 situation. It's so great that so many of you could be with us here this afternoon. In a moment, we will be joined by Principal Patrick Dean, who will be answering as many of your questions as possible in the next 90 minutes. We will also have the benefit of the expertise of Mark Green, Provost and Vice Principal Academic, Donna Janiak, Vice Principal Finance and Administration, Kim Woodhouse, Vice Principal Research, and David Walker, Special Advisor to the Principal on COVID-19. Uh, but before we begin, I'd like to welcome Ganeshuni Janice Hill, who is the Associate Vice Principal, Indigenous Initiatives and Reconciliation, who will open our meeting today. Jen? Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, greetings, everyone. Gunjokwa, sewada hunsios, ka nikari wasa, di chitawa nu horado, ne sungwaya diso, ne wahi rosa anyo, ne gari, ne ohandugari wadekwa, ungawana hats do. Ona, sewada hunsios, gunjokwa, ne egadi, ohandugari wadekwa, ungadi, wanungo de. Aguego unska, andi do what wait uni, ne ungwa negura, dano de, ten horado, ne aguego yunki, ye no ase, ji to unjade. Aguego unska, and did what wait nuni, ne ungua nigura, dano de atinuarado, ne aguego yunki yenoase, jeet carunyade. Dana oni gadi, aguego, de chidua nu horado, ne sungua dizzo. To nio duhak, ne zewat nigura. Today we give greetings and thanks that all the things on the earth and in the heavens continue to fulfill their responsibilities, even in the midst of all the challenges we are all facing. And by doing so, they therefore make it possible for us to continue to exist as human beings. We acknowledge and give thanks to the creator of all things and the energy of creation that this is so. Kanyunke Haga are relational people. Our original instructions as given to us by the creator include our relationship and our responsibility to the land, the cosmos and everything in between. These instructions embrace our oral traditions passed down by our ancestors and include our Ohandugari Wadekwa, our creation story and our cycle of ceremonies. All the teachings we received from the Creator revolve around our duty and responsibility to respect and live in harmony with everything that's been provided for our use in the natural world here on Mother Earth. All that we do is always supposed to be about lifting each other up and encouraging each other. Today, I would also like to acknowledge that Queen's University stands on the territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabek and also acknowledge the many other nations of Indigenous peoples who now call Kingston home. It's my understanding that this territory is included in the dish with one spoon wampum belt, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. And so we acknowledge and thank our ancestors for continuing to live in a way that ensures we remember. As a clan mother in my community, I'm deeply committed to preserving and promoting Indigenous knowledges, histories, cultures, languages, spirituality, and traditions. As such, I acknowledge our ancestors and welcome you to these lands on behalf of our men, women, warriors, children, faith keepers, and leaders. And so now the words that come before all others have been said, and we can all focus on the reason we've been gathered here. Nyawakowa. Thank you very, very much, Jen, for that. Um, and thank you all again for being with us uh, here this afternoon. We've had a lot of questions submitted in advance of today's town hall meeting. So many, in fact, that it may be difficult for us to get to all of them today, but we are going to do our best. Also, if during the conversation you have a question, you can enter it using the Q&A chat which you should be able to locate at the top right corner of your screen.
For any questions that we do not address today, we will be sharing the questions without any attribution, without any names, with our senior leadership team, so that we can try to address them through other channels and in future communications if there are outstanding issues. I also wanted to mention today that uh, today's session is going to be recorded and will be posted on the principal's website in the next day or so for anyone who was unable to attend uh, the session this afternoon. So with that, I think we will get to it. And I'd like to invite you, Patrick, um, to give a few opening remarks to begin the conversation. Well, thanks so much, uh, Stephanie, and uh, thank you, Jan, too, for the, the very moving beginning to, to our meeting today. Um, I want to say thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, we have uh, a, a, a very significant number of people on the call today, uh, and I look forward to the conversation. Uh, like all of you, uh, I'm talking to you from circumstances that are a bit unusual, and like all of you, there's a chance that a dog or a cat could walk across the front of the screen at any point during this proceeding, and I hope you'll forgive me for that. Uh, we're all getting used to working under uh, not always uh, the most congenial circumstances. This has been an amazing time. I made uh, the comment in a message I sent out uh, uh, not too long ago to the students uh, that this is an unprecedented uh, set of circumstances in which we find ourselves working. Uh, Obviously, I mean, when in previous phases of history has uh, uh, one or two thirds of the world been in lockdown, um, we've we've tried to bring the academic year to a close in circumstances that it were hard to imagine even going back three months ago. And I, I, I want to say thank you to everybody for extraordinary efforts to achieve this. None of it was easy and none of it came without personal cost to every member of the Queen's community. Uh, and I'm really grateful uh, to everyone for that effort. Um, there's considerable consolation and satisfaction to be had in thinking about the way in which the academic year came to a conclusion. Uh, the students showed great flexibility and patience, uh, and so did every other member of our community. Uh, dedication too, I should say. Now we're looking forward to the coming year uh, and to what the fall will bring, uh, and it is a very challenging time. Uh, everybody's looking for certainty uh, for in every respect. Uh, in, the, in the shadow of a, of a global health crisis like this, we all feel a fundamental vulnerability, uh, and obviously any form of certainty we can take hold of is a consolation. And as we think about uh, the way the fall is shaping up, it's actually very difficult to answer uh, many of those questions what the state of public health arrangements will be like in Kingston then as, as compared to now, uh, how those circumstances will re relate to the rest of the province, what the province will determine, what public health authorities will determine about how close we can come to one another uh, and therefore what the capacity of our buildings might be. Uh, these are all uh, moving parts and to, to reconcile them, to hold on to them with any kind of certainty and to make the decisions which we all have to make uh, at this time of the year in our institution is extremely difficult. And here again, I, I do need to acknowledge our whole community uh, for being remarkably resilient and patient in what uh, the, the English poet John Keats would call the state of negative capability, having to remain uh, with two potentially contradictory possibilities in your mind at, at the same time and still to have to find a way forward in planning for the academic year and uh, in planning for uh, your role in it. As part of this process today, uh, we're hoping to clarify some questions for, for everyone. Um, but it is important for me to say that uh, there is no easy communication uh, in the current circumstances. Uh, it's a complex situation and it's very important for me uh, that we not misrepresent the complexity of that situation uh, and to pretend there is certainty where there is no certainty. Uh, so I promise 
that, that we will do everything we can to keep open uh, lines of communication to all the various members of our community uh, and to help us all jointly make the best decisions for the university and for each of us individually. The university is a community of people for people uh, and it is really important for us all to remember that. You can look forward to ongoing communications as we go through the summer um, and uh, in all likelihood more opportunities like this uh, to put questions and to see if there's some answers that we can provide to them. Stephanie, I think I'll leave it there because uh, I think it's more important uh, to hear from, from people who have questions or to address uh, myself to, to the issues as people uh, have experienced them and understand them. I'll just end my comments by by reiterating uh, my, my deep admiration for an institution that I've really only, you know, what am I in my 10th month since returning. Uh, I came here, embarked on a conversation to try to establish our values, our goals, our aspirations and our ambitions. And uh, two thirds of the way through that process, we find ourselves under pressure of COVID, thinking about those things in a more intense way. What our values should be, how do we live them? How do they penetrate through the organization? And the big question, what, what is the service that our university should perform for humanity? Because right now one can see that the challenge is there for humanity and there is a role we all need to perform. Stephanie, I'll leave it there and uh, uh, take the first question. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Patrick, for uh, setting that context for us. So as questions began to roll in in advance of the meeting, some clear themes began to emerge. And the biggest question that seems to be on everyone's mind right now is, what is September going to look like? Will we see students return to campus for in-person classes or will we continue with remote delivery? Um, can you provide some comment on that? Sure, so this this is the fundamental question. Um, I'll, I'll preface my answer by just observing that through the, uh, from the onset of the crisis really, if one could date that to some time in the middle of March until now, and uh, continuing, we worked really closely with uh, Kingston Public Health uh, to understand how best we can contribute to the management of the pandemic, uh, while at the same time maintaining our operations and doing the job that we exist to do. Uh, and we'll continue to do that, uh, taking our cue from public health about what is possible and what is not. Uh, the authorities of public health are, are very thoughtful and very knowledgeable, but no one really can see into the crystal ball that would tell us exactly what conditions are going to be like in the, in, in, in the fall term. I think most reasonable people can see, however, that uh, this, is, uh, this is a challenge we will deal with in the longer term rather than in the merely short term. Uh, I think uh, as the first phase or the first wave of, of infections passes, there will be, as everybody knows, a freeing up of constraints on the part of the province and a part of our local authorities. And the challenge will be to make sure that that, that freeing up um, is done in a measured and thoughtful way. All of which is to say uh, that our coming back towards normality will in all likelihood progress with the same kind of steady incremental uh, uh, speed. Uh, we can imagine that uh, while there's the possibility that some courses could have on-campus components or be taught in person in the fall, it is unlikely that a major part of our operations uh, could be offered uh, in person. Uh, for the obvious reason, if you, if you think about the physical distancing guidelines, our capacity to accommodate all the students uh, uh, is severely limited. So even in the best of all scenarios, the likelihood of all students being able to return to campus is, I think, extremely slim. Uh, today, uh, uh, a, a message was posted uh, from the provost clarifying uh, what planning assumptions should be made for the fall. 
And I, I, I would summarize the university's position in this way, and that is to say that we need to prepare uh, to offer our courses and programs online uh, because that is the safest and surest assumption to make, given that we don't know exactly what is going to be possible in terms of in-person study. On the other hand, we know that there will be an opportunity probably to bring back a limited number of, of students and programs. And so uh, while we're preparing overwhelmingly for uh, remote delivery, um, we will nevertheless be working on the assumption that there will be a return to campus in modest numbers of students and uh, staff and faculty too will begin to return uh, in a slow, steady and incremental way to, to the university. So I, I think what we should look forward to in the fall is a hybrid a premised on a continuing majority of work being done through remote delivery, uh, but in which we hope to see uh, um, uh, a steady growth in the amount of in-person uh, work and study on campus. Uh, it's really important to me, uh, as was obvious in a statement uh, I issued last week, that we not lose sight of what we are. Uh, ours is an institution that lays part of its claim to excellence on its being a residential institution, on the physical experiences that students have here, the interactions that they have in classrooms and with their peers and with their faculty. And, and that is important to keep in mind uh, as we look towards the fall, even if the public health guidelines will not permit us to live that reality just yet in the fall. But when we think forward from the fall into the winter, uh, taking due notice of what the public health authorities are warning us about a second wave or the confluence of COVID-19 with influenza uh, during next winter, uh, we will seek to continue to move in the direction of, of a return to, to what would, in ordinary circumstances, define the Queen's experience, which is very much in person. That's, that's great. That's very helpful, Patrick. Thank you. I just wanted to note that um, it seems that there are some people um, on this, this call or part of this event that are having a bit of trouble with sound and video. Um, and I think that uh, all of us at different times have been experiencing that as, as we've tried to, to deal with our new remote reality. Uh, so just wanted to suggest that, um, you know, people um, may want to try different things with their connection. Uh, you may be having problems with your own internet connection um, and and some uh, experiencing some differences in the quality of um, of uh, the um, the connection based on whether you're in a web browser or whether you're in the Teams app. Um, so just a suggestion that people might want to try to play around with those things. Um, and, you know, if for some reason um, you're uh, not able to, to uh, continue to connect through uh, this live stream, um, do know that the event is going to be recorded and there will be an opportunity for people to, to view it later on. Uh, so just returning to questions now. So just to um, maybe uh, prompt a little bit more from you, Patrick, uh, you know, on what you were just saying about the fall. Are there specific scenarios that we're planning for in terms of fall 2020? And what are the factors that are going to influence our decision to offer classes uh, in person or to decide to uh, go through remote methods? Well, thanks, Stephanie. Yeah, with pleasure to come back to that. And I will in, in a little bit turn, turn to Mark Green, uh, who can elaborate on some of the specific scenarios. Um, what, one point I, I would make, which I, I ought to have made uh, uh, in, in my last remarks, uh, is that, of course, we don't make any of these decisions in isolation. I, I did indicate that uh, we would be influenced in, in the decisions we made about uh, the fall by um, let's say, government decisions and so on. We also need to think about uh, the role of our institution in this community and to make decisions that 
uh, both advance our educational and research mission, but also uh, support the city uh, in its management of a, a major uh, health crisis, as well as an economic challenge. Uh, and these are obviously all considerations that uh, it's incumbent on us to, to bear in mind. But maybe I'll hand over, if I may, to Mark Green, and Mark can talk about some of those specific scenarios. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Patrick. And uh, so we are uh, envisioning a, a, a range of scenarios. And uh, I mean, one um, is the possibility of uh, uh, of having a largely in person as we would normally have. Although, you know, we have come to the realization that uh, that is a, an unlikely scenario. And that um, and that we need to focus our planning and, and hence my message to faculty and staff about uh, uh, implementing um, uh, as quickly as possible our specific plans for um, achieving the highest quality um, uh, remote delivery experience. And uh, so, so I think that this um, uh, creates. Uh, uh, a challenge, but also a great opportunity uh, for us. And I, I'm really confident in the ability for us to deliver the, an exceptional experience, especially uh, when we get uh, busy and, and do that uh, together um, uh, to develop uh, over the summer months and, and make certain that things are resoundingly um, uh, of the highest quality. I think some of the things um, uh, Patrick was mentioning earlier about things that are special about the uh, the residential experience here at Queen's. Uh, but I also think a lot of that is embedded in the way in which uh, we all um, experience community and, and certainly the residential part in being in Kingston uh, forms a great part of that in a normal experience. And I think our challenge, and I know that we're up to it, is to look for really innovative ways of creating that connection and experience um, uh, but through leveraging uh, uh, the great activities that we have with our students, our student organizations. I know I was talking to the AMS leaders uh, yesterday about uh, ways in which uh, we can, you know, connect with new students and link up uh, in the same ways they have orientation groups on campus, how to replicate that if students are not physically here on campus. And I think a lot of that will also should be embedded in what we're doing in any remote, remote delivery uh, mechanisms. Um, and, and so I think it creates quite uh, some unique uh, opportunities uh, for us and also for interesting and different ways that uh, those students can create community with alumni, et cetera, because now alumni don't may not have to physically come to campus to have that direct um, connection with the students. And, and perhaps we will have um, uh, groups that are in other places that aren't uh, Kingston having those connection um, experiences. So it does create a wide range of uh, opportunities. And I, you know, I know that we are up to the challenge and uh, we're looking forward to ways that we can support everybody in, in having a, an incredible experience, both for our returning students and for those who are joining the Queen's community for the first time. So thank you. Okay, great. Thank you both very much. Um, okay, moving to the next question. So in the hope of some certainty, and um, you you both touched on that um, and and in the interest of trying to plan uh, for the near future, many people have asked if there is a date um, when Queens will make a firm commitment about what our plans are for September. And we've seen some other institutions um, make various kinds of announcements. Uh, in our case, will students know before they need to register for classes if that class will be de uh, delivered remotely or online? Um, do we know when we will make a final decision about September? Uh, well, obviously a great question. And uh, I, I think the answer to that is this is about 
the exact time at which those decisions have to be made. Um, I think many people on the call will be aware that, uh, in fact, the last two or three days have seen uh, finally uh, announcements coming from, from many universities. And similarly, uh, the, that is the point of the, the clarification note that Mark put out today. Um, so I think uh, we are now clear that with the exception of uh, a number of programs, and I, I could name some of them for you, uh, professional health programs, uh, nursing, medicine and rehab, um, uh, uh, graduate programs, uh, a number of graduate programs, uh, research-based programs for the most part, and uh, a, a portion of law uh, will in all likelihood be offered in person. Uh, so the, the drift of the, the province planning recommendation is that for the balance of our courses, uh, people should be working on the assumption that uh, studies will be uh, by remote, by uh, on on remote platforms of one sort or another. Uh, will students know that? Uh, yes, students should know that. So this information is there uh, now uh, publicly available to anybody. And uh, as I said in my message uh, from last week, um, uh, there is you know the the general articulation of the university's aspirations, but the situation will vary by faculty, and the faculties are all very clear on what will happen in their jurisdiction and, and from their faculty, students can glean all kinds of, uh, of very firm indications of what the, what the full term will look like for them. Okay, thank you. Um, we should shift now a little bit um, to talk about employment. Um, and a number of folks sent in questions um, related to um, employment at Queen's. This is a, a difficult time and one that's prompting a lot of concern about job security, quite frankly. People have commented that uh, some employees are having their hours reduced, being asked to use vacation or loo time, or being laid off completely. Um, while it seems or it may appear that other departments are relatively unaffected, unaffected, my apologies. So we've been asked, why are some continuing unionized employees being laid off and others not? Will we see more layoffs and how is the university making decisions around this sort of thing? Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, obviously, very, very crucial questions. Um, I'll, I'll preface my comments on that, and then I, I, I will turn to Donna Janiak to offer some thoughts of her own. Uh, just by saying that I mean, the, the university is, is about its community, uh, and as, as we've found ourselves in this situation, preserving that community uh, has been of paramount significance to me and importance to me and to the senior team. Uh, and also to ensuring that when we come out of this crisis, uh, we have everyone with us. And so far as possible, the university stays together as a community. Um, now, in, in the onset of the crisis, obviously some challenges have emerged for the most part. People who could work from home are working from home. Um, people on the front line, unfortunately, have had to remain on the front line and have done extraordinary work uh, ensuring that the university keeps running. Uh, in some parts of the university, however, there are individuals, and it's a small number, fortunately, at this stage, uh, that um, cannot work from home and for whom there is no work on the campus. Uh, and it is the, those, those people that uh, have been affected by, by uh, the measures you, you described. Uh, I think our thinking has been so far as possible to assist employees in that position in taking maximum advantage of the federal government's support for, for workers temporarily laid off and so on, because it's our goal to ensure that uh, uh, anyone who's in that position will be brought back as quickly as possible in, uh, on, onto the, 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 work, the university workforce as we begin to recover. That's one reason why it seemed important for, for us to be optimistic 
and quite bold in thinking about how bringing ourselves as quickly as possible to a return to normal kinds of activities, uh, thereby re recreating uh, the, some of those jobs that are uh, under the present circumstances um, uh, uh, in, in temporary jeopardy. But m maybe I, I'll go to Donna uh, and, and she can offer some, some further thoughts on this. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Patrick. Um, I did. I don't have much more. I think you've touched on on most of the points, but really, just I think um, as you have said, Patrick, that we as a senior leadership team really want to take this opportunity to thank all employees for their understanding and continued work and effort under these very difficult circumstances. You know, as as. Um, Patrick noted it's it's only been a handful and it's where the the services are no longer being offered um, that that this has occurred but they're difficult decisions for everyone involved and we know that um, it it is challenging for um, all units I'd also like to um, thank our employee labor groups because we we there there's ongoing engagement with our employee labor labor groups and we're working with them to make sure that we are supporting our employees as um, as Patrick has said we're seeing this as temporary um, we expect to have all of our employees back on campus as soon as they possibly can. Um, and, and as Patrick has noted, you know, that's why we're moving to have a phased in um, return to operations, um, respecting that we have to um, look out for the health and safety of all of our employees um, as we do so. So, uh, you know, not much more to add than that. So thank you. Thank you both very much. Uh, just a, a question. We've heard some recent announcements about the federal government's emergency wage subsidy program. Uh, is that something that we've looked into? Uh, does Queen's qualify? I, I actually, I think uh, this this is a, a topic on, on which Donna could offer a more uh, a, a more expert opinion, but uh, it, it does in certain circumstances. Uh, Donna, why don't you elaborate? Okay. Thanks, Patrick. So for the um, Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy Program, Queen's as a public institution does not qualify and that's that's the wage subsidy program that employers get to um, help with avoiding um, layoffs of employees but unfortunately Queen's as a public institution does not qualify for that Canada emergency wage subsidy program. Our employees um, if they are um, furloughed temporarily, would be eligible for the Canada Emergency Response Benefit or the CERB um, program. And, and as Patrick noted before, we're making sure that they are eligible for those programs, but not the um, Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, because that goes to employers. But as a public institution, Queen's is not eligible. Okay, thank okay, you thank for you. that clarification. Um, so moving on to um, a question from our Q&A. Sorry, I'm just going to try to retrieve it here. Sorry, there was a question that we had about residences. My apologies, folks. OK, so the question is, uh, most students living in residence share bedrooms, washrooms and common areas. So what is our plan? What's the university's plan for residents this upcoming school year? Have we had any discussions about 
um, how to plan for residences. Uh, yes, uh, there's a great deal of discussion and preparation that has gone on uh, about the residences. Uh, uh, as the question um, makes clear, the residences in their normal operation uh, would be difficult to maintain given the public health physical distancing guidelines and other constraints on, uh, on us as when we come together. So I know that th there is a group working on the residences and uh, a number of different scenarios for the number of students who, who could stay in the residences. Uh, everything depends, for example, on what the physical distancing guidelines are. Uh, uh, one potential scenario would see us concentrating uh, only on the use of rooms with uh, private bathrooms, and uh, that would take our potential capacity in the residences, I believe, uh, down to about 1,200. Uh, and so it follows from that then that there are limitations on the number of students who could be housed in the residence safely and in compliance with uh, the, the physical health guidelines. Um, so uh, all of this is to say, uh, yes, uh, we're looking very, very carefully at what scenarios might play out in the residences. Uh, obviously on the relationship of that to what we're doing in, in terms of on-campus programming. So for example, if you make the decision that uh, 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 programs X, Y, and Z will be uh, offered on campus, and I mentioned a number of them earlier on in the call, uh, the, the first question is what proportion of the students involved in those uh, would need to be in residence? Um, uh, and if so, for uh, the whole year or just for the, the fall term? And then if we were, uh, as we have discussed, to uh, see more in-person uh, a study in the winter term, uh, then there, there would be a different call to be made on, on uh, the residences and how many students might be housed there and what services might be provided in the residences. Uh, all of these issues uh, from uh, residence capacity and use to a configuration of classrooms uh, are, are very um, tightly interconnected a decision in one area makes certain kinds of challenges or requirements that have to be answered uh, in another area. If you decide on programs to be offered, there is obviously then a concomitant question to be asked about uh, residents. So um, I, I, I can say in answer to the question, a great deal of work is being done on this uh, in, in student affairs. Uh, and uh, there again, uh, we have to play with a number of scenarios because um, uh, there more than almost anywhere else, uh, the guidelines that public health have in place in the fall will affect what we're able to do. I'll leave it there, Stephanie. Great. Thank you. And thank you very much for the question. Um, obviously, something again where we're working um, very closely, as you said, with the uh, student affairs team and their expertise on um, putting together a range of, of options. Uh, moving to another key theme that came up in the questions that we've received so far. We've had a number of questions about the process of an eventual return to work on campus and in particular how this is going to affect people uh, in different circumstances. People may be concerned about their own health or safety. Uh, they may be concerned about the safety of vulnerable family members who have conditions that would put them at risk if they were to become ill with coronavirus. And then there is the issue of uh, childcare, for example, and if elementary schools and summer camps are to remain closed, then that is going to have some very serious implications for employees who are also parents if they are expected to uh, return to work full time. So just wondering uh, if you could give your perspective on any accommodations that may be made for people with these kinds of considerations and 
what employees can expect about the process of returning to work. Uh, could some of these employees expect to remain working from home, for example, but with accommodations? Um, what are your thoughts on this? Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, a re really important question. Uh, I, I think the answer to this is, is a simple one. Uh, the strength of our university depends on the health, happiness and prosperity of everybody in it. Uh, and we're in a, uh, an extraordinarily unprecedented time and the institution is going to have to continue to find flexibility in order to accommodate and sustain the people who are part of, of, of our university. Uh, this is not uh, something that's going to be over in a matter of months. Uh, this, uh, I mean, everybody will, I, I think, agree that la the last two months have felt almost like a year, but we have much more to go, uh, much further to go in, in this process. Uh, and we are going to have to find ways to support each other and sustain each other uh, and, and, and to address challenges which everybody experiences in different ways and with different levels of, of acuity. It is, um, and in terms of the, the human experience of working in, in a university, this time can have had no precedent. So yes, um, we will have to find ways to support the members of our community who deal with all of those things. I, I, I'm, I'm deeply moved by the challenges that people with, with young children have had to deal with uh, in, in the last several months, having both to work from home and to, to try to do something to keep their students' education moving on, those with, with vulnerable family members, elderly parents and so on. It's been extraordinarily difficult for, for everyone and uh, there will have to be many ways in which we provide accommodation to, to all the members of our family um, and, and we will do so. Uh, the, the, the basic assumption must be, uh, as we begin to return to work, that the safety um, and health of every member of our community is paramount. Uh, we are working on a, a phased in sort of reopening plan, if you were. Um, there is one being developed at the Council of Ontario Universities. Uh, we've worked very closely with, with our own public health people uh, to look at how we uh, can reopen some labs, which is a, a process already underway, uh, and to use that process to learn about how we bring um, more and more of the university back to something like normal operations. Uh, I think that is going to be a long process, uh, and in it, uh, we have to go to great pains to make sure that we support, uh, support our members. Um, a particular detail in the question was about whether individuals might be able to continue to work from home or might in fact have to continue to work from home for a period um, during the the return to work process and i th i think that that seems obvious if you if you look at the f physical distancing guidelines you can see it's not just students who are thinking about returning to work it's our own concentration of of employees whether it's in richardson where i am or in any other building um, we are going to have to be thoughtful about how many of us are in the workplace at any given time. Uh, and so that would seem to me to necessitate a period in, in which some people continue to work from home. The bigger implication of this, I think, and I'm, I'm, I've spoken a lot about how the danger of COVID is that we don't look beyond the end of our own noses and just deal with the immediate challenges. Uh, we need to be thinking about the long term, about when we come out of this in whatever form uh, the end of COVID manifests itself, when we come out of it, we need to be uh, moving ahead. We need to be progressive. We need to put some new things in place that are worth retaining. And I, I hope fervently that in, in the way in which we think about the shape of work and the place of work and the rhythms and habits of work, uh, we can come out of this with a new flexibility. Uh, you know, the old model of a singular shape to the working day, uh, I think, has long passed. Uh, members of our community have obligations, they have elder care to take care of, they have 
young children, we've 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 recognised that, but not under these kinds of circumstances in the past. Uh, I think we need to recognise that people's lives are increasingly complex, and there are ways in which the the workplace and the working day can be flexible around those things uh, in order to to make work an, a, a source of pleasure and fulfilment rather than a source of stress. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there, uh, Stephanie. I think that uh, I applaud the question. Uh, I think everybody should be assured uh, that coming back to work is not going to be proceeded with as a kind of mechanical process. Um, it's got to be uh, conducted according to very thoughtful engagement with public health uh, uh, thinking and guidelines. We have to go beyond those to think about what is good for the members of our community and for our mission. Uh, uh, and uh, in, in, that, in that process of returning to work, all these things will be paramount and have, have to be. That's that's great, Patrick. Thank you. I really appreciate um, everything that you've had to say because it it resonates so deeply, um, obviously, with the work that um, that I do in my office. We recently had a meeting of our human rights legislation group at uh, at Queen's, our, our first virtual meeting, where we talked about just this and. Um, the importance of people maintaining a broad and open-minded approach to people's unique situations during the, the pandemic. The obligation was always there and, and human rights and equity are not suspended during this time. Um, we continue to need to uphold these, these values and uh, part of that involves good faith conversations about how to accommodate people and their different needs. Um, you know, I, I totally appreciate what you had to say about the nature of work and the changing nature of work. And um, it's been coming for a long time, but this situation has really brought um, that notion into relief, I think, for all of us. And we're going to have to think about things differently. So thank you for that. Um, uh, speaking about return to work, so imagining that uh, that that we will um, return eventually, uh, as different as as that may seem, what are the plans for ensuring personal safety on campus, uh, and how uh, will staff and faculty be protected? I think people are wondering if there are going to be requirements uh, for folks to wear masks if masks will be provided, um, or as I think you were suggesting in your answer to the last question, will there be some arrangement made in terms of uh, people's presence on campus um, uh, and um, you know, um, a, a mix of in-person and remote that happens uh, in, in terms of work? People had questions about whether folks can expect to be tested in order to be present in the workplace. So from a public health perspective, what does the eventual return to work actually look like? Uh, th thanks, Stephanie. Uh, certainly the, a burning question for everybody. Um, uh, we've worked, as I, as I mentioned earlier, very closely with public health from the very onset of the crisis and uh, as, I, as I said also, uh, we will continue uh, to be guided um, by what is recommended to us as best practice uh, by the public health authorities. Uh, but here I think I, I'd like to hand over to Dr. David Walker because uh, David uh, became the principal special advisor on COVID-19 uh, back in March. Uh, uh, just when interestingly, it seemed like it was a problem of whether there'd be enough hand sanitizer long before it became a problem of the extraordinary proportions we now deal with. Um, uh, David came on board, uh, as many of you know, uh, formerly chair of the expert uh, review panel on SARS, uh, former dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences. And D David has been critically important in ensuring that all our thinking 
about uh, the management of the university should be done with the best possible and also most practical and pragmatic uh, uh, medical advice uh, uh, available. So, uh, Stephanie, could I hand over to David and he could uh, say a little bit about uh, about those kinds of considerations? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> am I audible? I'm hoping I'm audible. Um, thank you, Patrick, and, and thank you for the easy question. Um, uh, I would say to everybody first that what Patrick just finished saying resonates, I think, with me and I'm sure with all of us about the importance of caring for each other in this community that is Queen's and the community around us in which we're a critical part. And our ability to care for each other will require us to be flexible and adaptable in ways not seen before. Uh, that is for sure. Um, just, just to frame this a little bit before I get to the specifics, um, uh, I'm not unaccustomed to uncertainty, having spent 35 years working in the emergency department where instability and uncertainty was uh, moment to moment. Um, it's an uncomfortable feeling and uh, I'm sure all of us are yearning for clear, solid answers to difficult questions with time frames and, um, and some degree of certainty, which we do not have. Uh, some things we do know um, I think it's pretty obvious we are going to be living with COVID for a long time. Um, eventually there will be a vaccine which will either be highly successful or moderately successful or minimally successful. We hope the former. Uh, we know that we will find treatments uh, which will change the dynamic considerably. But I think for the next year, two or three, we will be living with COVID and we will be managing COVID. Uh, we live in Kingston, which is very fortunate. As Patrick said, we have a very close relationship with public health. Uh, you know, Drs. Kieran Moore and Azim Kazmani. Azim helps us every day. He speaks to the principal every morning at eight o'clock. And we live in a COVID free zone at the moment, which is very unusual. Um, our ability to manage the changes that are going to happen as populations shift and students come back to whatever extent and whenever uh, is going to be our ability to manage this, this illness. Uh, we've done quite a lot of work on prevention. I'm sure you're all familiar with many of the preventive strategies that are in place as parts of the university continue to work or ramp up. Um, they're going to have to be now amplified by our ability to monitor the situation as students inevitably show up. There's some evidence that students in upper years are going to come back to Kingston whether we invite them back or not. Uh, so we're going to have to manage that by making sure we have capable monitoring of the circumstances of that return. And then we need to be able to find people who have COVID-19 because there will be people who develop COVID-19 in this community and in our university community. And our ability to jump on those cases uh, and manage them will be the, abil the, the ability to look after ourselves. Uh, the way in which we identify cases and manage outbreaks will be the degree to which we'll be successful in protecting ourselves um, to the best way possible. I, I foresee that that the the future and the, and the near and midterm is going to be the usual uh, mixture of hygiene and screening and physical distancing and probably masks. Um, I think it's becoming evident that masks, uh, non-surgical masks, are things people wear to protect other people rather than themselves. So it's another form of protecting others. I don't know whether the university will supply them or whether we will get our own, but uh, those will be the four cornerstones. Um, in terms of uh, identifying cases of COVID and then managing them, uh, we've already agreed with public health that we will have testing facilities on campus and we're looking into ways in which that can be made most effective. Uh, Kieran Moore is very concerned about the conflation of an influenza outbreak with COVID. And so we are going to be undertaking a mass immunization program for faculty, staff and students um, because uh, having an influenza outbreak with COVID would be very difficult. In the end, the way in which we manage this has to be calibrated against our healthcare resources and our ability to manage those who will get sick and do so. And we're very fortunate in Kingston to have very sophisticated healthcare facilities, as you know, which have prepared for all eventualities and at the last count had the potential to ramp up to many, many hundreds of beds if necessary. So uh, 
in conclusion, I would say, yes, we're going to see a lot going on that will be put in place to protect us, our students, our faculty, our staff, and our friends in the community around us in the fall, in the winter, as we manage this through the next couple of years. Thanks so much, David. That's very, very helpful. OK, I'm going to move now to uh, a question from the Q&A. And uh, Patrick, it has to do with, um, uh, if I, I can call it, the, the visioning exercise that you've been involved in over the past uh, number of months. So uh, the person who's posed the question says, last year you initiated a series of engagements with the purpose of establishing new strategic guidance for the university. Clearly, the student leaning experience driver remains at the forefront under the COVID context. Would you say that under the current context, the strategic framework from 2014 to 2019 remains in effect and accurate? Or will the results of the discussions you initiated last year culminate in a new strategic framework despite the COVID context? <laughs> what a great question. Um, well, the simple answer is no. I, I think the strategic framework that ended in 2019 ended in 2019 uh, and we are uh, uh, it's quite clear to me from the conversations uh, that I've been having since I launched that process, uh, inclined to move uh, in, in a different kind of direction. Uh, I've said in a couple of contexts that, you know, the, the assumption is that COVID derailed that process or inevitably would derail that conversation process and that basically COVID would throw us back on, yes, the, the former framework and uh, uh, our existing ways of doing things at the time it hit. Um, I actually think the opposite. Um, uh, one of the questions I posed at the start of the conversation was, what are we here for? What, what's the function of this place? What is the contribution it ought to be deliberately making to society? Um, and uh, in some ways, that question has been answered by COVID. Uh, we've seen uh, different parts of the university mobilized to address the COVID challenge. So in the predictable way, um, we've seen researchers in, uh, in medicine and the biomedical sciences uh, looking at this issue um, and contributing to finding solutions that will, will be a benefit to humanity. But we've seen uh, in engineering remarkable innovations uh, uh, in order to address the, the, the shortage of personal protective equipment. Uh, we've seen our Nobel laureate, uh, Art MacDonald, uh, launch uh, a, a ventilator project nationally uh, and draw in contributions from our alumni in order to bring thousands of ventilators, portable ventilators, to communities, not just in Canada, potentially around the world, in parts of the world where such things, uh, let's say in sub-Saharan Africa, could be extremely valuable. We've seen the university do what the university did in 1918, 1920 during the Spanish flu. Um, uh, be reminded uh, that we're here not just in a sense to serve our own mission, but to serve a greater good. Um, and uh, I, that in many ways underlines the message uh, that I've heard repeatedly in the conversation that our university should be thinking about in very explicit ways about the ways in which we contribute to the achievement of the sustainable development goals, for example, uh, what the function is that we wish to perform for humanity at large. So to answer the question, uh, the last thing I would say I would want to see come out of this is uh, a rearticulation of the notion of not that there was anything fundamentally wrong with it, but the notion of the balanced academy, which is in the first instance a description of the way we configure ourselves, not a description of our mission. But our mission is much more clear, uh, I think, because of COVID. Uh, and I'm excited about the work that members of our community want to do uh, to increase the global impact of our institution. 
Um, so no, uh, uh, we aren't going back. Uh, of course, this is an institution that does two things. It uh, pushes the boundaries of knowledge in multiple fields, from the social and the cultural to the technical and scientific. Um, and while doing that, it engages in the formation and cultivation of citizens who will be agents for change and the improvement of the human condition. Those two things were true during the 2014 to 2019 framework, and they will remain true uh, uh, in whatever comes next. Um, but I think what will be different because of COVID is a heightened sense of the importance of our humane mission uh, as a force uh, in the world. So, uh, you know, I carried on these conversations. I, we can treat this as part of the conversation because it, it, it is uh, fundamental and important for us to address all of these issues. I mean, the one, one thing that came up in the conversation that I, I think should be taken note of right now because COVID does have a significant impact on it is the whole question of internationalization. If you had asked me in the fall uh, about the threats to the notion of the internationalized academy as I see it, uh, I would have pointed to chauvinistic nationalistic movements uh, across the globe, so south of our border, various other parts of the world and so on, where there was a sort of discernible movement away from uh, cross border cooperation and alliances. Um, the problem with COVID is it's introduced uh, a medical challenge to that notion of connections across national and cultural boundaries. And it will reinforce undesirable, as we've seen, undesirable political currents in different parts of the world. Does that mean that internationalization as a focus for Queen's sense of its own academic mission should uh, somehow uh, be reduced? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I think, if anything, uh, the attention that we pay to our international responsibilities and our capacity for international interventions for the greater human good is uh, uh, elevated uh, to a considerable degree by our present circumstances. How about that, Stephanie? That's fantastic, Patrick. I love the idea actually about um, this emergency not stopping the conversation, but actually prompting uh, the continuation of it and and inspiring us to um, uphold those those values and and our mission. I think that that's that's very meaningful. Thank you. Um, so turning now to a question about town gown uh, relations, a number of people have asked about Queen's impact on the health of those in, in the broader Kingston community. Um, as Dr. Walker, David, you were just saying, uh, currently no active cases of coronavirus in Kingston, which is extraordinary, no deaths, few hospitalizations. So, um, you know, everything that we have done around um, prevention and management so, so far has been uh, phenomenal. And yet there is much to do. And I think it's so wise and sensible what you were saying that we need to look toward um, measures taken in the future to manage um, and not to expect that the situation is simply going to disappear. So the question is, how are we working with our health partners and others outside the university to ensure the health and safety of all, all citizens? who live in the Kingston community. If we do welcome more students on campus in September and we see an outbreak in Kingston that could be traced to a student or traced to the university, is there a potential liability for the university? It's an interesting question. It, it really is uh, an inter interesting question 
and it speaks to our interconnectedness. Uh, it's interesting how in times of, of the COVID crisis, issues that are always there in the in in the life of the university come into sharper focus. Uh, and, you know, in the same way that uh, the relationship between the university and the community comes in, into relief, uh, let's say at homecoming or some of those other events, um, well, here we see it uh, very dramatically. Here, here, of course, the issue is the health uh, and the well-being of the entire Kingston community, and and uh, the stakes are that much higher in in this instance. Um, I will want to ask David to talk about this, and I, I, before doing that, I will just remark that David has made a number of observations that have, have been very influential on my thinking about this. Uh, over the, the uh, weeks that we've been working together on this question. And the one observation he's made is that when you look at the, um, the remarkable record or current position, I should say, of Kingston in terms of COVID cases, uh, you can give some credit there to the actions taken by the university in encouraging students uh, to, to study remotely, to go back home where possible, and so on. So uh, in that respect, we did contribute, I think, to uh, helping the, the emergency in the city be that little bit more manageable. Now, similarly, so the, the, of course, the, the converse of that is also true. The city has to return, as is, I think, obviously everybody, to some form of normality for human and economic and other reasons. And we will play a role in that too. We will play a role in it by seeing our students return, bringing more of our people back to the workplace. Um, and in the same way that uh, encouraging people to work remotely assisted public health, I think the process we, we're about to embark on uh, is potentially challenging from a public health point of view. And it'll be critically important for us to continue to work with public health just the way we did uh, in the earlier part of this process uh, to work with them uh, on the reintegration of, of, of more and more people to the, to the university campus. Um, what I've always appreciated in David is his assertion that it has to happen. We can't all be locked down forever. And so we have to find a way out of this. We have to negotiate a safe return to work and to study for students. Um, and. Uh, uh, why don't I, instead of putting words in David's mouth, let, let him speak for himself on this. I, th I, I do think it's a critically important question on which he has a, a unique perspective. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Um, well, it, it's a very, it's a very good question. Um, and I, I preface the answer with just a few observations. Um, the first is that Kingston is many things, but one of the things it is, is a place of higher learning uh, with RMC and St. Lawrence College and Queens and that and, and the army base um, and prisons. Um, these large congregate populations uh, define Kingston other than tourism, which probably won't come back for a little while. So Kingston is us and we are to some extent Kingston. Um, for every Kingstonian I meet who says what on earth will happen when students come back and infect us all, um, I, I, I meet their spouse who says, please bring the students back. My restaurant's going under. Um, so, and I think we've seen in other jurisdictions when infections spread, as it will in Kingston, um, either a move to togetherness or a move to apartness and blaming. And, and I just pray that as we work with our partners and our community and our neighbors, that we consider this uh, as a whole in, in totality for the benefit of us all and not to divide us. Because quite frankly, um, if you think about it, um, the next case that uh, we have in Kingston is as likely to be one of our community as it is to be someone in the prison community or in long-term care or someone who drives a bus, I don't know. So we need to be prepared for that as do our partners and that's gonna mean communication and partnership so that we approach this together uh, we certainly have our, our partners in public health. We have the most high functioning public health unit probably in the province. Even the premier has alluded to that. So we have we have tremendous advantages. We do, though, have the paradox of prevention. We've done such a good job of prevention that we are still a naive population in terms of this virus. Uh, only 61 of us have had it and they've all recovered. 
It does remind me, though, and I don't I didn't want to alarm people earlier. Um, one of my next door neighbors is a colleague of mine in the in emergency medicine who every time he walks home says, remember, David, this is a mild illness. Now, for 97 percent of people, it is relatively speaking a mild illness. But because of the magnitude of the number of people who get it, we see the 3% who, who are in jeopardy and get very sick or die. And they, of course, in the vast majority are those poor souls in long-term care. One of the things we did not do well is we targeted making sure we had resources in hospitals, acute care hospitals, thinking that was where the carnage would be, when in fact it was in another place. Kieran Moore reminds us that we're not aiming for zero cases this coming winter. We cannot aim for the impossible. We will have cases. We will manage those folks who get sick. We will try to prevent anybody getting it from them. Uh, we will manage it if they do. Um, we have wonderful resources to do that. And I think we are part of a community that will work together on this and pray that we will rather than, than apart. So yes, I don't know about the liability issue, but um, uh, this is a community response, not one of segments and uh, sections. Thank you both. Um, really appreciate um, what you both had to say about community and working together and our humanity in the situation. Um, because this is hitting people uh, very, very hard and in a very human way, on a very human level. And I think that people need a sense that the needs of people within the Queen's community is still high on the list of priorities for senior administrators. And I'm just wondering, Patrick, if, um, you know, for our, you know, maybe one last uh, comment before we hit, need to wrap up today. If you could offer some perspective on, you know, that notion of our common humanity and how we can continue to make that apparent in everything that we do from this point on and in all of the decisions that we make. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, I, I said it earlier on, um, and I, I know I've said it on a number of occasions in communications of one sort or another. Um, the university is a is a human institution that exists for a human uh, and a planetary good, uh, without being fully informed by considerations of humanity. It cannot do its work. Uh, its values will be misplaced and it cannot succeed. I, I think uh, this this issue is crucially important. Uh, and the COVID, the COVID crisis has challenged this. Um, while I say that uh, humanity is the business of, of institutions like ours, there's a sort of an odd contradiction in that, in that I've, I've often said to people, you know, if you want to achieve a profoundly human goal, don't try and do it through an institution. Because institutions do have a potentially dehumanizing effect on what they do. And they have a way of draining the human value uh, out, of, out of initiatives. Uh, all of which is to say, um, I think everybody needs uh, to have faith that these kinds of considerations are paramount in our thinking about how our institution weathers the current crisis and establishes a course for the future, which must itself be powerfully informed by humane considerations, both for ourselves, the people who work here, and for our mission, the people we seek to affect. Um, I, I hope people will accept that reassurance. Uh, in my experience with our team, with, with everyone I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, that is the priority uh, and uh, we will do everything we can to continue to advance that. I know from the outside it often looks as though uh, humane considerations somehow fall out of out of the picture. In, in a situation like this we're balancing many 
many issues, uh, many, many goods, and many, many challenges. And so it can seem uh, that uh, in, from the point of view of one group or other, uh, the institution is functioning in a less than humane way. I accept that critique and I, I uh, obviously, given what I just said about institutions, uh, we can always do better uh, in making apparent that these humane considerations are at the root of the decisions that we're making. Um, and we'll keep, we'll keep on doing that. Um, so I said what I did at the start about communication. I think frank communication with our community is what's really important uh, so that people can understand the complexity of the challenges and also have an opportunity to remind individuals in positions of leadership in the university that uh, there are these human considerations that should never be forgotten. Um, I'm really optimistic, I have, have to say, Stephanie, about uh, uh, Queen's and where we are going and how we will come through this. And I say that while recognizing how very, very difficult a lot of this process has been uh, for, for many, many people in the institution. Um, I, I'm, I'm grateful to them for persisting because the cause is a great one. Uh, but I'm also grateful to be reminded uh, that it's one thing intellectually to acknowledge that we are here to serve a humane purpose. Uh, it, it's another to remember that in uh, every decision you make and every communication you issue. Um, but thank, thanks for that question. I, I, I do think it gets to the heart of what we're trying to do. And it certainly gets to the heart of what I value uh, in, in our institution and in the work that we all do. I'll leave it there. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, I mean, first and foremost for recognizing that, um, you know, uh, we're a community of, of people all with our different struggles and there are folks out there who um, are facing uh, some real challenges and, and thank you for uh, leading with your optimism. Um, I think that that is just about um, all the time that we have for the session today. Did you want to offer any uh, any closing closing thoughts? That was pretty good for a close, but there might be more closing thoughts that you have to to offer and um, uh, and just just some final words of thanks, perhaps. Oh. I. I I won't offer a, a further encomium. Uh, uh, it is important to be optimistic. Um, it's also important to be realistic about the challenges that we face. So uh, I, I will leave my general comments there, Stephanie. Thanks. I, I, I want to thank uh, you very much for, for being such a moderate moderator. Thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, really appreciate that. Uh, Jan for, for her opening and I know for her closing words. Um, uh, uh, Mark, uh, uh, David, uh, Donna, and also Kim Woodhouse, who was on the call and ready to answer any any research questions that came up. I want to thank all of them for for being here today, but also uh, for uh, being uh, working so closely with me in in advancing the values that we've I think tried to articulate today. Uh, huge credit to leaders across the institution. I'm thinking of the deans who have thought long and hard about the best way in which uh, their faculties can, can do the right thing for their students and support their researchers uh, and uh, uh, directors and department leaders across the, the university who've been so creative and thoughtful and, and committed uh, to keeping the work of the institution moving forward. And I'm, I'm grateful to everybody and, and, and thank them. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Stephanie. Okay, thank you again, um, everyone, for your time this afternoon.
Um, and again, just wanted to remind uh, folks who are part of this session that we have taken note of the questions that people provided and uh, we're, we're closing now um, in the interest of, of time and not, um, you know, sort of, of going down another entire line of questioning, but um, your questions will be um, brought to the senior leadership table and we will be looking at other ways of providing answers to those questions as part of the um, ongoing communications that are, are going out um, around this situation. So just want people to know that um, your questions are very valuable, uh, taken seriously, and, and people will strive to answer them. Um, and also just a reminder that this session has been video recorded. So if you know of folks who were not able to see this, or if you had any difficulty um, with your own audio video today, um, that there will be an opportunity to review this. It will be up on the principal's website um, in the next couple of days. And so with that, um, if there's nothing else, and I don't have anybody directing me that there's anything else that we need to do, um, I would like to ask uh, Jen if you would mind returning and, and closing the session for us today. Jan is muted. Jen? I'm muted. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, um, Principal Dean. Gunjokwa sawadahunsio skatni garibasa. De chitabanu murado ne sungwayat diso. Newahi Rosa Anyo, Negari, Neohandu Gariwa Dekwa, Ungawana Hetstu, Ona Sawada Hunsio, Skunjokwa, Ne Egadi, Ohandu Gariwa Dekwa, Ungadi Wanungo De. Aguego Unska, Andiwa Wait Nuni, Ne Ungwa Nigura Dano Dea Tenuarado, Ne Aguego Yunki Yenoase, G. Owen Jade. Aguego Unska, Andiwa Wait Nuni, Ne Ungwa Nigura Dano Dea Tenuarado, Ne Aguego Yunki Yenoase, G. Karun Yade. Dana ona dano ona gadi aguego de chidwa nu horado ne sungwa at diso. Tohni o dunhak ne sewa nigunra skunagunhak. So, um, as is my custom, because we opened and I brought all your minds together, it was important that we close and I separate your minds from the work that we did here today so that you can carry on with all the other important things that you need to do today. Skanagunhak means let us go along in peace, let peace continue. And also just a short reminder of my teachings that it's important and it's our responsibility as human beings to always be lifting each other up and to encourage each other to live our best life. And I think that's part of what the message has been today. At least that's part of what I heard. So I thank you for including me in this important event today, and I thank you all for your part in it. Nyawakoa. Thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, Stephanie.